Hi, I'm Chris Edsall. I'm uh, the Head of Research Software Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Um, one of the other hats I wear is the Acting Principal Engineer in the um, Cambridge Open Zetascale Lab, um, where we're looking at uh, what would be needed to uh, make the next generation of HPC systems. So we've, we've hit Exascale already. Uh, what more do we need to do to, to get to bigger systems? And one thing that's obvious is we're not going to get to a bigger system with a CPU-only approach. Um, at the moment, um, every every large system on the list in the, in the top 10, with the exception of the Japanese system for Gaku, is a combination CPU and, and GPU machine. Um, and when I say GPU, um, people normally think of the GPUs from NVIDIA um, because they've been very successful. Uh, making and selling them. I should disclose I have no stock in any of the companies that are mentioned in this talk. Um, so why would you want to use Sicklematic, which is how we're going to pronounce it? Um, you might want to, if you have um, CUDA code already, if you've got code that's written for GPUs um, and it used the NVIDIA um, software development kit, uh, it's written in CUDA, but you've got a problem, uh, the, the computer you want to run it on might not have NVIDIA GPUs. So you might be running on um, Lumi with AMD GPUs, um, or you might be running on Aurora um, with, with Intel GPUs. Um, this approach actually does work with um, NVIDIA GPUs as well. So what you can do is you can take code that only runs on, on one GPU vendor and write it so it can run on all three. Um, one thing I'm not pointing out, not mentioning here is performance portability. If you wanted to hear about that, you have to talk to Tom Deacon from the University of Bristol. Um, so we're just talking about running and running correctly, not necessarily running at max, yeah, yeah, the, um, the max limit of the, the hardware. So you have CUDA code, you want to run it on something that's not necessarily um, an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, and so in this case, you want sickle code. You might not know that, but that's, that's what you want. Uh, which raises the question, if you, if you didn't already know it, the question is, what is sickle? Um, so it's a, um, a language um, library standardized by uh, the Kronos group. We're the same people who do OpenGL um, and uh, Vulkan. Um, and so the same way that, say, um, ISO, the International Standards Organization, standardizes C++, um, and then you have multiple implementations of C++ compilers, so you can, you can get a compiler from GNU, or you can get a compiler from the LLVM project, or you can uh, get one from NVIDIA or Intel, or any number of people will provide you a compiler. Mostly they're all LLVM at the moment. Um, so you have a, a standard, and then you can have multiple Im implementations. So Kronos standardized Sickle, um, which is a way of doing um, offloading of um, kernels onto uh, devices. And the device can be a GPU, or weirdly enough, the device can actually be the CPU that's running on the host. You can just offload it onto to OpenMP and, and parallelize that way. It's actually a useful way of debugging uh, to see whether your, your code is working is to flip between CPU and GPU. Um, because you can use the same source code to target those those heterogeneous devices. Um, the the title was a bit of clickbait um, because I left out one important consideration. Um, this really only applies to C plus plus code. So um, if you're in the situation some of my colleagues are, and they have Fortran um, code written for GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and Fortran, can't really use this approach. But if you have C or C++ um, or something you can call into C and C++ with, say Python or even Fortran with ICC bindings, um, you can you can do this. And as I say, it targets CPUs, GPUs, even targets more exo exotic offload devices like like FPGAs. Uh, so this is the game plan. Uh, so we start on the left. We've got uh, source code written in CUDA. Um, and then we use the source-to-source -source translation tool, um, now called Cyclomatic. Uh, and the output of that is C++ source code with Cycle calls um, in place of the NVIDIA CUDA API calls. 
then you take that source code, you build it with a SQL compiler, which is which you know, one of your choice, target, targeting the um, the device of your choice. Um, so it's fairly simple. Um, and see exactly how simple it is. This is this is the um, uh, the lines of code I would run if uh, the next bit doesn't work. So I'm going to cross my fingers. Would have run if the next bit doesn't work. And see if, yeah, this is the problem the previous presenter had. I think it is the network because this was working fine 30 minutes ago in, in the accommodation. So I'll just go back and reconnect. So using open on demand here um, to connect to our HPC cluster in Cambridge. Um, and the, the cluster is heterogeneous. It's made up of various different node types. Um, so I've got a uh, uh, two terminals. The one on the left is running on um, the partition which contains uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, so the uh, A100, uh, 80 gigabyte ones. We've got four GPUs per node. You should be able to see that with NVIDIA SMI. And in the right hand terminal, uh, just because I can and I'm flexing, um, Uh, well, I'm, at this point, I should, should also check. Can everybody see the text, or is that a bit too small? It's a bit too small. Okay. Uh, if you've seen uh, NVIDIA SMI output before, you'd know what this is. This is just a, a listing of each of the GPUs, and this is just to prove that we've, we're have we on the right node, um, we've got the right hardware. Bear with me while I um, resize this terminal. And likewise, if you have, um, as we do, Intel, uh, there we go, Intel Data Center GPU Max 1550 GPUs, which is a mouthful, so I'll just call them PVCs from now on. Uh, the command to look at it is XPU SMI. Sorry, bear with it again while I uh, size. Okay, so we've got um, two different GPUs um, and we've got some source code. So we've got the hello world of, of GPU programming. We've got vector add. So this is probably not going to fit on the screen. Uh, so standard uh, CUDA code, you import the, you include the, the, the header file. Um, this bit, let's put some line numbers. Uh, this bit here, lines 12 to 17, that's a standard um, kernel. Um, we're going to add um, the, the index in the array um, uh, plus 1.0 as a float, and then we take A, B, and add them together and put the result in C. Um, so we malloc some uh, memory on the um, device, get some pointers to those um, arrays. Then we launch the kernel, that's the thing with the, the triple chevrons, and uh, pass it the, the pointers to the, those arrays on the devices. Um, and then all going well, uh, we copy the data back to the host, uh, free the device memory, and then we iterate through the array that we've got back and print out what we've got. So. Uh, so far, so standard. And so let's build that. And run it. And it's going to print a screen full of numbers. So that's the, um, the thread index from 1 to 256. Uh, added to itself, and so we get the, the even numbers 2 to, to 512. So uh, I've done nothing special so far. This is just the result we want to get when we run it on the Intel side. We want to get the same. This is the, the, the ground truth, the golden output at the moment. Okay, so we go over to the Intel side. Go into demo 1. So we still have our, um, our source code. 
Um, and now we use the now we use cyclomatic. Um, it's a better name than it used to have. Its old name was DPCT, uh, and that stood for DPCPP compatibility tool, and DPCPP stood for Data Parallel C++ compatibility tool. It's super long mouthful, and so cyclomatic is a much better name. Um, the the command line used to be called DPCT, and so you'll st whoops, uh, what we will do. So um, on this on this node, I've got um, the Intel One API stuff already loaded. So if I module list it, um, it's already provided. The One API compiler is twenty twenty two point one. Those are actually a bit old. Those aren't the ones I want to use. Um, so if you if you'd installed the One API toolkit on your laptop, you'd be doing a similar thing at this point. You'd be sourcing the script that sets up the environment variables. So in our case, we have to run user local software. Intel One API twenty twenty three point two set bars. Sh. Right. Now, if I say which DPCT, there is one. Good. Um, but uh, following the, the the updating of the documentation, I'm going to, I'm going to follow Intel's documentation on how they do this. It's now called C2S, which is basically CUDA to sickle. Yeah, that's, that's spoiling it. You can see what it looks like now. Um, uh, so C to S minus minus version. So that's that's what we're going to use. We've got the .cu file here, the CUDA file. We're going to run C to S on vector add .cu. Um, so don't worry about the could not automatic could not auto detect compilation database. I'll explain that in the the second demo. Um, because I didn't specify a particular place to put the output of the tool, it's chosen its default, which is DPCT underscore output. Uh, so it's found the 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 single file I I told it to look at vector add. It's analyzed it, migrated it, and it's put the result in the minus in root folder, which is using the default names. Um, and we'll talk about the URL at the bottom in the second demo. So let's see what it did in the file system. So previously we had um, vector add and vector add.cu. We've now got this new directory called dpct underscore output. If we have a look at that, uh, we've got two files. I'm going to ignore uh, main source files.yaml. Um, but we've got the the vec the migrated vector add file, so it's called it. It's changed the the um, the file type Sussex from suffix from .cu to .cpp, uh, and it's added in that .dp there, so you can see that the dpct tool did did that. So if we just uh, open that file, uh, so you see at the top where we used to um, hash include. Uh, CUDA.h, we're now looking at, we're now hash including sickle. And this this library here, DPCT, is a, a convenience library, which sort of patches over some of the, the differences in the in the API calls between um, in the semantics of the API calls between CUDA and Sickle. Um, so CUDA API calls can manipulate the state of the device um, for sub subsequent calls. Whereas Sickle is more atomic, so um, if you've got any state that for your CUDA code's persisting, you need to do that separately to, to the the Sickle call. So that's what the DPCT library is there. And then you see um, this this is this is what used to be the um, CUDA kernel. This is what it looks like in Sickle code. We're still taking A and B and adding them to get C. Um, this verbiage down here is how you set up um, the, the objects that Sickle needs to talk to the devices. So you need a, um, a Sickle queue. Um, before we were calling CUDA malloc, now here we're calling, calling Sickle malloc device. Uh, this is a bit more verbose than the um, CUDA launch syntax. Uh, this is Sickle kernel launch syntax, but uh, the benefit here is this is actually just C++ Lambda syntax. So while CUDA code is not C++ code, the syntax isn't exactly the same, there's some additions, SQL code is exactly C++ 
um, source syntax. Uh, the benefit there is that if you've got tools that understand C++ source syntax, like linters or language servers for IDEs or anything, it's just C++, so, so it'll be compatible. Uh, so that's the kernel launch. Um, this is the copying the data back from the, um, uh, from the device to the host. And as with the, the CUDA one, once we've finished with the device memory, we free it. And then we iterate through the vector and print the result. So fingers crossed, um, we can build this and run it. Uh, so the compiler I'm going to use is the Intel 1 API compiler, the C++ one, which is IPCX. Um, and it needs to know, for, for sickle, so sickle source, it needs to know about that. So you pass the minus F sickle flag, and we'll call it vector add the executable. And that's the code we're going to compile. Thank you. <laughs> uh, obviously, if you were, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm freestyling it on the command line. Uh, we're all RSEs. We would write this in a make file, check it into our version control system. Uh, this is very much uh, uh, for demo purposes. So the compiler is called ICPX. Thank you, Arian. And pass minus F sickle flag. And the network's frozen again. There with. And bearing in mind, we want to get the the numbers that we've got on the on the left hand terminal, and no errors. And there we go. So we took a piece of source code that was written in CUDA and only ran on NVIDIA GPUs. We ran a couple of commands, so we ran C to S and some change directory. Uh, compiled the result, ran it, and we got the same answer. Um, and now that that translated source code, we could run on an AMD GPU and we could run on an FPGA as well. Um, so we've liberated the code in some sense. Um, that's the end of the first demo. So I'll see if we've got any quick no questions. Okay, that was obviously clear. Now let's do the... Uh, that one I expected to work. This next one, not so much. I've, I've saved because it would, it would be dishonest of me to stop at this point and say it's as simple as just running C2S and compiling the results. So it's not always that simple. Um, they've, so the, pe the people who've written um, Cyclomatic have run it across various code bases to see how well it performs. And they reckon it does 90 to 95% of the work um so unfortunately depending on your code base how it's written you might wind up having to do that last five percent so we'll have a look at that uh it's it's a bit fiddly and possibly a bit boring but i do want to prove that this this will work so it's going to demo desktop back again yay right let's go to demo two and this comes from a, a set of mini apps um so um in, in our line of work, we, we're quite often running tests on, on hardware, um, and it doesn't make sense to test on a, a full-size application because there are so many variables, so many things that can go wrong. Um, so we'll, we'll quite often generate something, a synthetic benchmark. So that vector add from before, that's one of the things we quite often use wrapped up in a benchmark called uh, stream just to test memory bandwidth to see how fast you can pull data out of uh, memory into the, into, CPU, into the device that's computing it and, and back. Uh, so you, at one end, you've got synthetic benchmarks like Stream or, or Limpack. At the other end, you've got full apps. And in the middle, you've got a thing called mini apps. And these are quite handy. You, you wouldn't use them for, for research because they don't have everything you need. Uh, but they're a sort of cartoon of the, the, the main app. Um, so it would reproduce most of the numerical um, features, not necessarily exactly the same results. So um, there's a really good set of mini apps um, from Spec Corporation called Spec HPC, and we use those for looking at um, 
uh, energy efficiency, um, you know, tweak, tweaking our HPC system to see how that affects um, different sor sorts of codes and you know, whether codes behave differently to material science codes. So um, this is another mini app benchmark suite. This is the Rodinia benchmark suite. And in particular, the, the application, the mini app we're going to look at is Needleman Winch or Winch, and pardon my pronunciation. Uh, I'm not a bioinformatician, so this is a, an al influence and algorithm from bioinformatics. And it's frozen again. I should, I should stop talking and keep typing faster, and then maybe it won't freeze. Um, so if we go into there, remember again, the um, terminal on the left is the NVIDIA one. And so if we just uh, make that. Right, run it. So this is going. To, it gives us a couple of arguments: four thousand and ninety-six and sixteen. And uh, we got no errors. We processed the matrix. It's good. And it wrote out result.txt. And presumably, if you're a bioinformatician, that means something to you. So that's that's the result we want to achieve. Um, so let's hop over to the Intel side and go into demo two. And this is different to what we had before. Before we had just one CUDA file. Uh, now we've got a project. Uh, it's got some Microsoft project files in it and a Microsoft uh, whatever it is, solution file. It's got a make file, which is cool. Um, ignore the fact that it's got compile underscore commands.json. I think that's because I didn't sufficiently clean it after um, after testing earlier. But we've got, um, and if you look in the source file, source directory, we've got uh, several CUDA files, two CUDA files in a, in a header file. So we can't do what we did before and just feed, feed a, um, yeah, one file to C2S. Um, what uh, Cyclomatic also provides is a thing, a, a command line application called Intercept Build, and it basically you it does a dummy build of the project using whichever build tool your project uses, and then figures out what would have been done. Um, so it's possibly better if I just uh, illustrate that. Oh dear. If I restart this and then illustrate that. say so intercept build. In this case, since we've got a make file, we'll insert build make. And there was no output there um, because I think I need to, uh, it's just, um, uh, we just run intercept build make. And if we look at the, the updated files, so it's written out a zero, I don't know why it's written a zero length file, but it's written out this, um, this the short thing, this commands, it compile commands.json. And in this example, it's, it's not particularly huge. If you had a larger project, that this would be a, a, a larger file. And this is what um, the C2S command needs um, to migrate a larger project. Um, so just a, a, a thing here, you don't absolutely need uh, a system running an Intel GPU to do this process. All you need is access to the NVIDIA SDK and the C2S tool, the Cyclomatic. Um, and then you can take the, the, out, the migrated output off to some other system and then do, do the build there. Um, it's just for ease of use of demoing that the, the, the jobs, the, the, the executables actually run that I'm, I'm doing it on, on the Intel machine. So um, the output of the intercept build was that JSON file. And then we run uh, C2S. Then we restart the thing. It's a good job I've got 45 minutes. Um, and you know what? I'm going to cheat.
because so we give it um so on, on the left here you see the readme still got the old name for the tools so it's still calling it dpct but we're going to call uh dpct minus p compile commands.json and then before we just use the oh for god's sake i'm getting about 30 seconds before it freezes i don't know what i can do to it well that wasn't what i intended to do let's try it again what i intended to do is to demo the uh minus in root equals dot so take the source code from the current directory and put the, the migrated source code in outroot equals migration right so uh, unlike the the smooth sailing last time we we've got some warnings here um and you see it gives a reference number for each of these warnings it says warning d uh, they're actually four digits it's the uh, the screen needs to be a bit wider um dpct 1101 and so there's a a reference here and you can look up and i don't even know what 1101 was uh, one, one, one. Oh, don't give me that. Anyway, the the point being, um, for each of the the diagnostic warnings, you can look up what it is, and you can see whether the tool had trouble translating the the source code. Um, whether it thinks you sh you should look at it, whether it's flagged it for for human review because it thinks that you know you, you, it it would work, but it might be better if you did something else or whether it's just failed outright and it can't trans there's, there's something in the CUDA code that it's it's not able to translate at all so that's that might be the the five percent of the the 95 percent so um so what we've got now what we've got now is a new directory called migration Ignore the DPCT output. That's when I accidentally hit enter before I meant to. Uh, so again, we've got the main source file.yaml, which we're going to ignore. And mirroring the, um, the file structure from the original project, we've got the source directory. And again, it's, it's changed the .cus to .cpps because it's made it C++ source, and it's put DP in the middle of it. Um, uh, so you know that that, that was tool that did it. Um, we can have a look at maybe one of these. Let's go and find one of these errors that it's flagged. And so 11, so 1043, the version related API is different in sickle and initial code was generated, but you need to adjust it. So it's saying, yeah, this might work, but you should check that out. And in fact, I'm going to cheat again because I've got uh, 14 minutes and I'm surely going to... We've had a question come oh, in. Have we? Can oh. you show again how you generated compile commands JSON? Cool. Okay. let's actually blow away those so we'll reset this to how it was right so this is the project as as we got it and then we run intercept build intercept dash build make there yeah. i should have tab completed that ah. no i'm confused uh 
to explain why why that worked, um, inset build calls make and traces what it does, but because I hadn't made clean, make said there was nothing to do in this in this um, in this directory because I already had a minus o uh, start or o in the result of text. Anyway, so the answer to the question: How do you generate the compile commands? Dot, dot JSON, you run inset build and your build tool. So it supports make, cmake, and ninja. Um, and uh, there's something in the in the readme about if you can get your um, build system to output the the commands in the in the correct format, then then it would work with inset build as well. So uh, so as a result of doing that, make clean, running an inset build, we have, we have compile commands like JSON again. Okay, now what needs to be fixed? So if you're going to source, um, I'm going to cheat with the readme because it tells me, and this. This is a somewhat error prone process, but I, I thought I needed to, to show you. Um, so it's not all as plain sailing as demo one. So let's copy the make file. I need to go up one directory, copy the make file. Oh, that's a. Make file. So we're going to need to change the compiler. It's no longer CXX. It's uh, ICPX. Um, the source files. Okay, well, I've, I've figured out it doesn't matter how fast you type it. It'll just freeze in the middle of it. It's definitely this room because it wasn't doing this elsewhere. So that is now needle.dp.cpp and that is needle kernel dot dp.cpp um, we're going to ignore that line because we don't have any cu files anymore um, and because this example was made before some changes to the tool were made um, if you use the old name for the compiler, it, put, it would put the minus F sickle in there for you. Uh, so let's have some CXX flags there. No, that should do. Okay, so we've updated the make file. Uh, we go into migration and type make. If we haven't addressed all the warnings, the compilation step will fail. So let's watch that. Uh, oh, oh, actually needs so we we because I reset things and blew away the um, the directories. I, I now need to do that. Um, that's just. that again okay so we go into the migration file for the directory and uh, take that there so far so good it's found the compiler So I made a mistake, but the mistake meant that the thing worked. <laughs> so we, we have taken the, the bioinformatics code, converted it from, from CUDA to Sickle, compiled it, we've run it on uh, an Intel GPU, uh, GPU, and we get, um, this is not the way RSE should test things, but by eyeball, this looks like a similar set of numbers. Um, a, a unit test here or an end-to-end -end te integration test would be better. 
Uh, what was supposed to happen is that was supposed to fail um, because you remember um, there, were, there were a whole bunch of warnings and the, all those DPCT comments that it had flagged in the source code. Somehow I've accidentally got the corrected, the manually corrected source code in. So um, I don't know whether to leave it there or to break it on purpose and see. Well, what's... we've got two questions. We might okay, let's first. questions. So the first question is if site uh, sickle, sickle which they support CPU, does that mean ISPC has been abandoned or are there still advantages to both? Does that mean which has been abandoned? I, ISPC. ISPC. Is that a typo? Uh, another Intel magic technology for device things. Right. Uh, I think so. <laughs> if you, if you, if you, so this, this, um, so this is awkward because I'm demoing the Intel tool, but uh, Sickle is a, a non-Intel thing. It's a, it's a cross-platform open, open standard. Um, so I mean, you know you could you can get sickle uh, sickle compilers from the University of Heidel, Hipsicle, You can get it from Codeplay from Scotland. So their one's called Compute CPP. Intel's one. Um, it, their their approach is called One API, and basically they take took all of their previous software and put the word One in front of it, and so it's now you know One DNN, One MKL, One everything, uh, One API, and. I'm guessing there's been a scorched earth behind it on on other tool names. I can see it's also part of one API, but I'm doing the same thing. Right. <laughs> I don't know what the use case for both are. I mean, the last one minute they were possibly fourteen hours ago, so it doesn't seem abandoned. For the stream, uh, the 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 word from the audience is I I SPC has not been abandoned because the last commit to their repository was fourteen hours ago. So. Um, the second question was, um, have you got any comments basically on the difference in between CUDA performance and Sickle performance on the same device? Um, yes. Uh, so we ran a, um, an experiment in Dirac last year. We, we got four teams and um, took some source code, took some actual real applications and said, well, let's not try and port the whole application. Let's just port one, one kernel and, and see what happens. And there we got three quarters of the results. So three of the teams were able to, to um, get the code running. The, the team that were not is because they're there was nothing to to port because the CUDA code was generated on the fly by the system, and so that was a bit a bit too tricky to to build into a thing. So what we did is we took those those applications and then we um, we ran the experiment of trying different Sickle implementations, um, Hipsicle and Compute CPB as I, as I mentioned, and and different devices, and so we we tried that matrix of you know, for each application, which compiler, which device. Uh, we didn't get 100% coverage. Um, I can't remember the result. <laughs> um, the, there's, a, there's a good paper from ISC from 2021, um, which does basically the same thing. It's the people from um, Bristol, as I said, if you want to talk about performance portability, look up uh, the University of Bristol HPC and, and Tom Deacon. They've got some good results there. Um, which showed for the you know, for the same source code and the same device that the implementation of Sickle had quite a quite a difference in performance. Um, you'll note that I'm using the, the very latest Intel um, uh, compilers today um, because they are continually improving. So that result from 2011 at the, the IC conference um, is probably no longer valid because everything's changed. This is a fast, fast moving um, environment. Uh, Another question's come in. Roughly how much of the CUDA API doesn't have a Sickle equivalent? I think you may have covered this one. Um, the, the, I, I did, but um, this probably deserves a longer answer. Um, the base CUDA API um, is, is fairly well covered. So, you know, moving memory around, launching kernels, doing that sort of thing. Um, the libraries aren't. So if you're going up, to, if you're not using CUDA, but you're doing a level above like um, CUPI or QDNN or, or things like that, not all of those uh, are, are directly translatable. Um, the best place to look is possibly the, um, the, the documentation 
and let's see if we can find one that's uh not deprecated yeah things like uh the local mem size in sickle is not a complete equivalent of shared mem block you may need to adjust the code um is the one that's not implemented at all yeah sickle currently does not support setting resource limits on the device so um it varies so uh, I, th I think my advice would be it, it doesn't take as you saw it doesn't take long to, to to experiment with this so i'd say download the tool try it and see how far you get you might get lucky and and not have to do do much work at all okay that's all the questions we've got so far you've got about two and a half minutes left i think that's almost certainly not enough time to break it and fix it <laughs> um but so of course i have to keep restarting this okay so let's uh move that aside and let's Right, so same commands we had before, um, which was inset build make, C2S that. Not that. Go into migration. Copy the make file. Yeah. And so again, we want to be X. We want that to be. It doesn't. You could call that anything. I've lost the ability to vim. All right. And then we need a CXX flags here. And need a set one. Well, it's three o'clock. We might start losing people. How yeah, long do you think we left? I, I need I need coffee too. <laughs> um, so this is what yeah that's the end of the thing. Uh, I knew this would happen if I tried to type too quickly. Uh, so where we accidentally had it working before. Oh no! I think I know what I did. I overwrote the local copy. Anyway, if you want to have a go, if you want to have a go at this, um, this is on the um, uh, One API Samples uh, repository, and uh, and you can download that and have a go. Uh, Thanks a lot for that interesting demo, Chris. Right.